Hi, welcome back. We're going to be talking about Module 2, Developing Sport Pathways, in this um, particular lecture. But if you remember back into um, Module 1, where we talked about uh, one of the paradigms of sport development, uh, the first one, which is sport, uh, just what it's called, sport development or, or development uh, of sport. And that's really where we're talking about the uh, pyramid analogy, where we're getting people into the system, which the pyramid, at the lowest rung, and that is the mass participation level. Uh, so the idea is, is um, and just to recap, is to get as many people into the system participating sport as possible, then we can move them up to more competitive ranks and get them to elite levels. Um, and that's how uh, a lot of our systems across the world operate. Doesn't mean that's the right way to do things, and that's what we're gonna be talking about uh, in this module on what are the components needed to get people into the system, to retain them into the system. Obviously, they can't reach an elite level if they drop out early. Um, so how do we keep them in the system? And then how do we transition them through the different levels? So if mass participation might be just for leisure, or just for play, or just quote unquote for fun. Uh, when you get up the, the different ranks though, the competitive nature of sport uh, takes hold and it becomes uh, a little bit more of the reality of our sport systems. And so how do we transition somebody that was just in it for kind of fun or leisure um, all the way up to maybe elite athletes who are getting paid, it's their job, it's their career. Uh, so things get a lot more serious. So um, in this, uh, again, in this lecture, we're gonna talk about those pathways, how athletes uh, re are recruited into the system, are retained in the system and transition. And then what are those elements and components needed for an efficient system to work. Uh, so we talked about United States Olympic Committee um, being one of the uh, you know sole providers or sole sources of you know attracting mass participation uh, mass participants all the way up to the elite level. Um, but we have many many different uh, organizations, sport organizations that have an effect on people's participation. So um, that goes from coaches to administrators to athletes to athletic trainers to everybody that's involved uh, with offering and delivering sport. Again, as a reminder, the outcomes that we seek for sport, the benefits that we claim for sport are only dependent upon how we offer it and how we design it. So those components then become necessary. And so we really want to unpack those in this module, in this uh, particular lecture. Again, I'm not gonna go into um, the finer details throughout this. I wanna give you a really good overview so that when you do watch uh, this, uh, you can go back to your readings and uh, read it through uh, perhaps a more uh, educated lens um, through sport development. So um, the first thing I want to focus on, and going back to Green's article in 2005, uh, in which he uses the pyramid analogy to uh, talk about recruitment, retention, and transitions. And so she proposes that there's four processes um, that we need to understand um, in order to um, offer sport uh, in the best way possible to keep participation levels high. So those four are recruitment, motivation, socialization, and commitment. So behind me, you can kind of see a sliver of it here, but um, when I post this you know, on, on Blackboard, you can see it, but this is another model that is similar to the pyramid analogy, but you can see it's very square, if you can kind of see it behind me, and they have different rectangles on different levels. And uh, this is what Sport Canada uses, um, and it's called the Long-Term Athlete Development Model. So it, it talks about each level through the different ages, um, so zero to three years old, and five and uh, to nine, and, and so forth, and really developing uh, physical literacy and the different skills of the sport, sampling different sports uh, until you get up to the more competitive ranks. But it also talks about um, playing sport for life. Uh, so after your competitive juices wane and you wanna get out of sport, do you just stop? For a lot of people that is you know, 20 years old, 19 years old, you still have you know, uh, 60, hopefully good, 60 more years left of your life. So are you, do you just give up sport? Well, our systems are 
are really designed to support the elite track, which we kind of got into a little bit. Um, so what about for everyone else? Well, this model talks about, uh, and you can kind of see it right behind me, uh, is, is staying active for life. If we want benefits like uh, physical benefits, psychological benefits, even social benefits that come with sport participation, then we need to design sport around a non-competitive or a different purpose for those people that don't, you know, don't care if they win or lose or get money or doing it for a job. Um, they're doing it for other reasons. So we need to uh, consider those um, different factors. So um, first one for uh, recruiting or attracting participants uh, into kind of the sport participation pyramid or analogy is uh, Green talks about sponsors. This is really just significant others in people's lives. So you talk about family members, friends, uh, even organizations or teachers, uh, administrators, um, even website now with the onset of um, you know the explosion of social media. Uh, and YouTube and, and all kinds of different things that you can get on social media. And then of course school systems, teachers, phys ed teachers, coaches, um, etc. So when Green talks about sponsors, it's those other people that get you into playing sport. We know that family has a major influence on which sports we tend to choose. Um, and choose is an <laughs> operative word. Sometimes some of us don't have the choice. Our parents choose it for us. And you can maybe think about your own life. Uh, you know, did you really choose soccer or football or basketball? Or was it your dad or your mom that actually put you in there and you didn't really have any choice in the matter? Um, so anyway, that's um, the, it starts with a family. Then it starts to branch out. Even your neighborhood, your community, your next door neighbor, you might um, conjure up a, a, an old friend that was playing football, so you wanted to do it too. Or the neighborhood was getting together to play soccer and half the team or all the good players were playing uh, on a soccer team and you wanted to do that too. You went home and, and told your mom and dad. So anyway, these are the things that Green was talking about is these significant others um, that really have an influence on getting us into the sport systems in the first place or recruitment, which then suggests that you know, if you're a sport organization or a sport manager, you need to develop and design sport programs that might meet the needs of those people, right? So parents is the first one that comes to mind. Offer a program that might be affordable or, you know, uh, easy for transportation, or, you know, it's easy for the, the parent to uh, get involved with, um, whether it's practices, maybe there's only one practice per week, or. Uh, what have you. So these are just some things to think about, um, but uh, I bet you d you may not have thought about all these other surrounding kind of people uh, besides the sport participant um, in and of itself. And then of course the sport participant, they have to enjoy it, they have to like it, um, they have to learn something um, or get better, uh, those types of things. Uh, second one she points out that's really, uh, that has an impact on recruitment is the opportunities to play. And so if you advertise that everyone will play several quarters, uh, then it's more attractive. Um, so that's what she's really talking about. And opportunities to play really drive enjoyment, skill development, um, a sense of identity and your psychological self-esteem and self-worth. And so these are some things that um, you know, we need to make sure that we can offer and design and market in a way that delivers um, you know, on the back end because that'll get people excited and, and want to uh, come out to your club or your sport organization to actually uh, uh, play. And then uh, finally, she argues that smaller programs as opposed to larger programs are better because of uh, providing the opportunities to play. So uh, smaller programs, but maybe many of them, um, and I'm talking about in the community, in the United States, from a, na a national standpoint, as opposed to these big, large conglomerates that control our sport. Our sport, uh, and I'll get to, into in a second, there's so many different participants with so many different outcomes that they want to reach and so many different, uh, I guess, objectives on participating in the first place. So to, to have one system that can do all of that, or one program, one large program that, can, that has a philosophy that can do all that, 
is is difficult um, to pull off. So maybe you have many of those that can serve a very diverse, you know, population of our sport uh, participants. So that could be the type of sport. I mean, think about all the different types of sports that we have. Um, different uh, coaches, different volunteers, just different interest level, different, um, whether it's individual versus team, so different socialization or, or social support that goes into it. So just think about, hey, if, if um, a young kid wants to participate just to make friends, you probably don't want to put them into an individualized sport uh, like tennis because, you know, th there's not a lot of opportunity to make friends. Okay, so um, anyway, those are just some things to think about um, when you're trying to, you know, figure out a program to attract or recruit participants in the first place. Then Kovala uh, talks about in, in her article the effects of gender typing, and this is really about gender and just um, highlighting and illuminating gender differences. And it's really fascinating because we're not just talking about male and female. There's degrees of maleness, quote unquote, and degrees of femaleness uh, within those gender types. So uh, there, don't think that a male is, is a male, uh, meaning um, very masculine. There's some feminine males, if that makes sense, or some that are um, kind of in between. They're male, kind of have male and female tendencies. So this might, we might need to design our sport programs around around those um, different traits of gender. And so this highlights, hey, it's not just male, female, it could be a wide spectrum within just those um, genders. Um, so that comes with different interests, different identities, uh, different um, self-esteem, different uh, maybe physical or biological um, or physiological, I should say, um, attributes. So um, it's just highlighting, hey, you know, um, gender is not just uh, very simplistic. It could be very intricate and nuanced. So it's really bringing that to life. And then DePero et al.'s um, article is, talks about age as a determining factor and influence. So we wouldn't offer, um, so they don't really say this in there, but um, this is me kind of speaking uh, through this article. It just highlights differences in ages. So an older uh, Italian, which this is what this article um, talks about, underlies or illuminates the differences of motivation for those older athletes. And in their study, extrinsic motivation or benefits or rewards or some sort of um, tangible outcome was needed for them to participate in, the fe um, in, in a sport. So they wanted something out of it. They didn't want to waste their time or money or resources. Okay, as opposed to maybe intrinsic motivation, you're just doing it for the love of the game. Okay, and so that what this suggests is that when I'm developing a sport for older adults, then I need to take that into consideration. So all kinds of different ages, whether you're 60 and above or middle age, um, you know, around the 40s, or if you're young adulthood, 20 to, to 30 years old, all of these different segments, and then especially youth, have different needs and wants and interests um, from psychologically, but also physically. Uh, when we get older, our bodies do break down. Uh, this is a biological fact. Um, but not everyone's bodies um, break down to the point where they can't do anything, which is, a, um, which is an assumption, a wrong assumption and stereotype. There are some 100-year-olds that go out and run a marathon that I probably couldn't do right now. So um, understanding some of these assumptions with gender, with age, with whoever your possible participants that you're going to go out to uh, recruit um, participants for your program, you need to... Uh, consider those those things. Um, so anyway, uh, I think you're starting to see, we talked about some demographic uh, elements that might have an effect on recruiting your participants. Uh, and then Kay talks really gets into kind of this family influence on sport participation, but she goes a step further than what I kind of highlighted earlier. She talks about resources and social class. So as you can imagine, uh, if you have a little bit more money, uh, household income coming in um, into your family, you might have a little bit more options on maybe expensive sports like golf or even ice hockey. Ice hockey has a lot of 
you know, equipment that you have to buy just to participate. Golf, uh, of course, the equipment, but then the membership fees um, to some of these exclusive clubs or just the green fees for uh, public golf courses. Um, so you have to do that and uh, in order to improve your game, you have to pay for that. And then uh, ice hockey down here, maybe in Texas or a warm climate, is a lot more difficult to find an ice rink than up in Minnesota or, of course, Canada where they're everywhere. So uh, what I'm getting at is just transportation. So here in Houston, you might have to go to the Galleria or some other places um, th that there's limited amount of space for ice rinks. So that might be a 30, 40 minute commute, maybe even an hour commute to get there just for one way. And so that puts a strain on not only gas resources, but your car and, of course, scheduling during the day. So this is what I'm talking about, resources, not just financial, but time is a resource and uh, some other things um, within the family that you might have to, you know, uh, decipher. Um, so the family is not just a parent influencing them, saying this is what you're going to do. Um, as far as their sport choices are concerned, but they might have some limitations as far as their resources um, in order to allow their, their kids to participate in the f first place. But um, Kay's article definitely um, kind of highlights the fact that the primary socializer of a sport participant, uh, especially youth, is that family structure. So behind me, uh, you can kind of see just some of the factors that affect recruitment. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just to kind of whet your appetite a little bit. I want you to understand that this idea of recruitment, there's other things that actually uh, branch off of recruitment. So you have, you know, family and friends that we talked about or sponsors, opportunities, participate, enjoyment, those types of things. Uh, other demographic information, whether that's uh, socioeconomic status, uh, there's race, there's gender, there's age, all of these factors might go into um, or affect your reasoning for designing a program that would increase recruitment. And then of course knowledge and information, I didn't, uh, there's no, there wasn't an article that talked about that, but that's huge. I mean, you, you hear about the, the old soccer moms um, and, uh, you know, uh, that disseminate the information on what programs are, are best. And so you go ask a soccer mom, which program should I get my, you know, my little one into, right? Well, uh, that might have a lot of bias. There's a lot of filters in there. Nowadays, we have uh, social media and websites, um, but I would say that it's still underdeveloped as far as the information. It's all over the place. It's very confusing. It's not coordinated. And so finding places to play just in the first place is um, not an easy task. So uh, just information and uh, marketing and the messaging will affect recruitment efforts and the outcomes. So that's just a little bit uh, about recruitment. Now let's move on to retaining athletes. So assuming that we get them in to the system um, and participating into sports, so that's kind of one check, but we gotta retain them. They might have a horrible time, right? Their first experience, and perhaps they lose or they get injured or a coach yells at them. These are some things that might, you know, lead to dropout or people not, you know, um, continuing to play. And you could imagine all of these touch points throughout your sport career, if you ever played sport, you know, if you start at three years old, four years old, shoot, it could be your parent uh, being too domineering or too aggressive on trying to get you to um, be better, um, to a coach, to just a field that was just really bad and maybe injured your knee or something like that. So there's all kinds of factors that might affect your choice to come back for that next season. So this is what we're talking about here. So one of those, of course, um, is motivation. And motivation does affect recruitment, but it also affects ret uh, retention. So Green was talking about it kind of in this um, aspect. And uh, so when you're recruitment or re retaining folks, you have to offer something of value. Of course, this kind of is common sense, but if you think about it, just like going to the grocery store, you're trying to figure out, you know, 
what to buy and you have so many different choices. Well, the choice that you end up with has some sort of value. You have evaluated that in your mind that this is a benefit to me, so therefore I'm going to choose it for whatever that reason is. So sport is the same way. So, uh, and you can think about it. Do I play sport? Do I study? This is all going into your leisure time. Do I watch TV? Do I play video games? Uh, I would suggest that video games back in, you know, when they first, you know, came onto the scene in the 80s and now they're all over the place, they're very inexpensive to get, you know, video games could be a major factor for retaining folks. Uh, so youth, you know, video games aren't yelling at you. Video games you can play over and over and over again without anybody, uh, without you feeling embarrassed if you make a mistake, as opposed to out in the field, it's very public. If you miss you know a save and a goal goes in then who knows maybe parents or coaches are yelling at you who wants that so um, there's many different things that might offer a better value than what our sport offers and so we need to be cognizant of that so um, think about the things that sport may offer of value joy satisfaction um, of course a feeling uh, a sense of belonging with friends um, your obviously physical health you know, to maybe um, lose a few pounds or to just have a good heart rate, uh, standing heart rate. Uh, of course, self-esteem and then a skill development. You know, um, nobody really wants to stay at a point where they're really bad at something. I mean, that's the whole point is to progress and to improve. And so if you can see those outcomes, then maybe you'll have a better time of retaining your athletes into the system. Um, all different kinds of participants play sports. So there's all kinds of varying motivations and varying um, values that people place on their experience. Experience is very intangible and subjective. So this is why it's really difficult to get at. So um, there's no one right way, there's no wrong way, but we do have research that would suggest, you know, um, trends and themes in which we need to design our sport around, which is uh, our family, um, limiting the costs, limiting the psychic costs, which are like transportation or traffic or just the difficulties of participating in the first place. Um, coaches, uh, we have research that suggests that uh, the better the coaching, the better you know the experience of the player, so they might be retained from that. Um, so there's all kinds of different things that have that. Um, also, are, are your participants task-oriented, really focus on getting better or doing what the coach says, you know, or do they provide maybe a strength in social, rela uh, social relations and building relationships? And that is very advantageous to a, uh, maybe a team sport, okay? Um, and having good teamwork and team chemistry, we hear these terms uh, when we talk about sport teams. Um, so assessing your participants then becomes necessary uh, from the coaches to administrators to even parents. And then, of course, the participant themselves. They may need to, uh, you know, evaluate, why are you doing this? Um, you know, in just my own personal life, I always ask my son, are you still having fun? Uh, you know, are you, why are you still playing? You know, is this something you enjoy? Is this something you want to still continue? Okay. Uh, and then another uh, construct that Green talks about is uh, socialization. So it, when you're in a, a particular in a team sport, but this is not limited to just team sports like basketball or soccer or football or some of those. Um, this could be an individual sport. Socialization is just with other people and how you relate to other people. So participants' expectations, perceptions, subjective value assessments all come into play via the process of socialization. And that's really just, um, you know, exchanging norms, beliefs, behaviors, perceptions, communication with other people in relationships. So interpersonal relationships, even your intrapersonal communication comes into play. Uh, group communication, um, you know, more than just two people at play. So um, all of these count as the process of socialization. And through this, subcultures develop, or you can call them cliques, but subcultures is really the, the objective term. Cliques maybe have a, a negative connotation. So subcultures are basically, you know, if you have a team of 10, but you have a group of 
three or four people that are really tight and they start, you know, exchanging different, you know, handshakes or different mannerisms or different words to describe a phenomenon that they're experiencing, that starts to develop a culture within itself. So you can think about this, whether it's a huge team like football as, you know, in the NFL, it's 53, team, uh, 53 uh, people on high schools. It's up to, you know, over hundreds of, you know, over a hundred people. And so you can imagine that there could be, you know, a tight group of friends, you know, whether that's the first team defense or the first team offense or the scout team or the defensive backs or the linebackers. I mean, you start to develop some of these subcultures. So that could be very helpful or it could be very hurtful. Think about uh, hazing and things that are negative experiences that might develop because of a subculture of a team. Um, And we've seen this, uh, really bad things happening because a culture was developed, it was trans, uh, it transcended different, you know, years of teams um, and it's passed down to, you know, different levels or age groups so the seniors pass it down to the juniors juniors pass it down and so forth if i'm talking about high school and so uh hazing's been a real big problem and people you know drop out lawsuits there's a a lot of legal ramifications so you know some teams like football teams in high school have lost their entire season well that doesn't really do very good for retaining athletes right they've they're kicked out and then the next year, do you think a parent wants to put their child in there? It affects recruitment. So these things are independent of one another. Um, and then we're talking about commitment is kind of that last, you know, processes, if you will, that Green uh, talks about. Um, but this correlates with enjoyment. You're not going to stay committed with something if you don't, first of all, find value in it, but if you don't find enjoyment. And so... Um, this really lends itself to opportunities for involvement. So enjoyment and opportunities involvement really go hand in hand and underlie commitment levels in, in our sport environment. Uh, social support and potential for success. Social support is, you know, um, positive reinforcement from coaches, from players, uh, you know, uh, players that you play with. Uh, parents, administrators, all of these things. If you, you know, let in a goal, is everyone yelling at you? That that wouldn't be positive social support. So these are some things that we have uncovered in our research that would lend to greater commitment, positive social support. And then goals and expectations uh, need to be managed. So you can't provide a really good marketing tool or marketing message and then not deliver on it on the back end. So you're inflating expectations, you're manufacturing expectations, and then you gotta make sure you deliver on those, otherwise people won't come back. They'll think you're actually lying to them or misrepresenting what the sport program's all about. So that's what we're talking about in expectations need to be managed. And then goals for the different participants. You know, have them set goals what to achieve through the year, have team goals, have individual goals. These may all um, affect somebody's uh, commitment level. So Coakley talks about this in his article. um, And um, if we don't really understand what the factors about retaining folks, then it'll lead to athlete dropout or burnout. And he talks specifically about burnout and this is dependent upon someone's identity to the sport itself uh, and to them, you know, psychological identity, their role identity, their social identity, and then control issues. Do I have the sense of control of my decisions when I'm playing in sport? Or is it the coach making all those decisions for me? And I have no volition and I have no independence um, when I'm playing. And so you have to feel like you have control over your own destiny. Otherwise, it'll lead to burnout. People are just uh, tired of it, uh, psychologically, mentally tired of playing, and so they um, discontinue their sport participation. Social organ and, and so uh, Coakley really talks about this in a, um, it's not the athlete's problem, which sometimes the athlete has been victimized and stigmatized as athlete burnout. It's their problem. It's not their problem, what Coakley argues, and I tend to agree with them. It's a social systemic problem, organizational problem, because they're the ones that are controlling 
the components of the sport design. And so if coaches are not being trained and managed appropriately or disciplined appropriately um, on the behaviors that uh, we know lead to people maintaining their commitment or participants maintaining their commitment, then maybe they shouldn't be a part of the system or the program. Administrators creating policies and procedures that would allow a good, fair, enjoyable sport participation environment. So there's a lot of these different uh, factors that um, not only society, but the organization in which the sport is being offered um, does have a major impact on. Uh, and Wall and Colt, Cote uh, go a step further and talk about what leads to athlete burnout is deliberate practice, which basically says off ice or off the field training. So weightlifting and you know, uh, running sprints and the real like training regiments that you might see at a pro level is starting to inch its way all the way down to shoot, even seven year olds are are lifting weights at that age when we know physically and physiologically that's not a good thing for their body uh, long term. So anyway, um, they talk about deliberate practice. The earlier that you start these training, these off the field training, um, hardcore training, it leads to quicker burnout and less time to um, to play the sport. And so um, that's something that their research article talks about um, in ice hockey um, up in up in um, Canada. So these are just some of the factors that affect retention, motivation, socialization, and commitment. But this is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the ones that Green had pointed out uh, that you need to, uh, you know, kind of dive into and unpack. What are those elements and components? If I'm designing a new sport, what do I need to consider if my goal is to retain the participants uh, in my in my sport system? And so we have. Um, Hopefully, you know, we, you see that we have control over that as sport managers. And so it's a great responsibility for us. Um, the last kind of component is once we retain them, we have to transition them successfully through the different levels of sport. So you might be just starting out, um, no experience. So you might have to really take it easy on uh, the different skills. It has to be uh, something that um, is maybe not as comp not competitive at all. And then as you move up the levels, people's, you know, purpose and mission and objectives about their sport participation may change to be a little bit more competitive. Uh, so it just depends on what type of league you're in and what type of uh, sport uh, you're offering and the philosophy that might affect transitions and, and um, going up the system, meaning a more competitive level uh, and up in age or out of the system? How do you transition athletes out of the system so that they may want to take a break from sport, but they want to come back to it maybe 10 years later? So we don't want to, you know, make anybody uh, dislike it so bad that it's a tragic part of their life that they would never want to play sport ever again, okay? Um, because sport can be played throughout your entire life, um, as the DePero article uh, had shown. Uh, so there's upward advancement, there's lateral advancement, so going to different maybe competitive leagues but staying in the same level, um, out of the system entirely, into the system, meaning you know recruiting people for the first time, um, and then something that is almost never talked about is going down in the system. That is a negative kind of stigma, uh, stigma or a connotation. If you drop a level to improve your skills, that is uh, considered to be uh, really bad uh, for some people. So imagine if you're playing varsity and then the coach says you're not good enough, you got to go back to JV and you're the oldest person there. That Well, you, you tend to drop out because we haven't managed that transition pro process appropriately. But if that person were to stay in, really develop the skills, they could come back and put and, and make major contribution. Maybe the level is just too much for what their skill level demands. So we see this all the time in minor leagues. Um, you know, in, in our pro sports, but we rarely see this in our youth sports um, and, and kind of dropping levels. So uh, it's moving up, moving down, and out of sport participation kind of um, levels. And uh, so when you're talking about that and you're designing a sport program, you're really designing 
or managing a new environment for people. Think about, forget sport for a second, think about going to a new job and meeting all the, your new coworkers, meeting you know, bosses or VPs or, or higher ups, uh, understanding just what the culture is of that office, what to do, what not to do, the policies, procedures. Someone's gotta teach you that. You know, you don't know that when you first come in. So HR, human resources, will come in with a training program and a, maybe a boss of yours will, will um, get you on a, uh, you know, a goal development or development uh, plan, individual development plan. Um, then you might be paired up with a mentor that kind of takes you around and, and you know, uh, gives you the ropes of things and who to talk to, who not to talk to, uh, those types of things, uh, the office politics, if you will. But someone, you know, that's a whole part of learning a new environment. And you'll be amazed in sport, we don't do that. It's, hey, come join our team. You better catch up pretty quick or, you know, we don't need you. Um, it's amazing how we don't really manage that transition process. But if we do, then the chances of retaining our athletes and recruiting new athletes becomes a lot higher. Um, and so transitions, we need to understand it creates somewhat of a disruption. And when I call, say a disruption is really a, a loss of resources. And resources could be money, but it could be psychological resources, social resources, um, or a change, maybe I, uh, I go back and, and it's not always a loss of resources, a change in resources. So you could go into a new team and, and have more friends or more people. And so that would be maybe a, an addition. But um, anyway, so it could be a, a gain or loss of resources during a transition, but nevertheless, a disruption in your normal day-to-day -day life or activity. So your equilibrium, your status quo, that's what I'm talking about, is disrupted. Your resources are disrupted. So in order to adapt from that change and transition, you have to find the resources needed to either you know, recover the deficit or the losses of the resources or to manage the new resources, maximize those resources in the best possible outcome or best way, okay? And so that's what Schlossberg really talks about in, in her um, transitions theory, okay? And so in, behind me um, is kind of, you start off with a transition, you have individual and environmental factors that are disrupted or changed perhaps, and then behind me you can't see, but it's um, a circle that says adaptation. And the quicker to adaptation or to accept the transition as a normal part of your life and kind of moving on is uh, might be a slogan to use here depends upon the resources at these stages sport can act as a resource in and of itself in transition so that's some of my research that um, i uncovered and uh, i i found that social support and even just physical resources infused uh, during a transition phase of a person's life actually affects a quality of life that they perceive and so the more that they participate in sport the more that they actually feel like they've adapted quicker and their quality of life has um, improved so sport can actually act as a resource in and of itself or a provider of resources. So think about social support, think about physical uh, resources, think about who, uh, you know, even financial resources if you're playing pro sport. Uh, so anyway, um, so think about that when you're thinking about transitions or changes in your sport participation and how can we manage the transition itself? How can we uh, you know, develop, design, infuse this transition period with the resources necessary for people to overcome it quickly so that they keep participating, they talk about it with their friends so that their friends then want to play and it affects recruitment. So these, all these things, all these factors really do affect one another, okay? So um, support systems for athlete development now becomes a major component, right? I mean, these are all you know, whether that's the organization, the coaches, all the things around an athlete's participation environment needs to be looked at and, you know, designed in a way that can uh, offer positive influence. Um, so organizational linkages is what Green talks about. 
in the United States, we have a very uncoordinated sports system, meaning there's all these different silos or different sport organizations that may offer it, but they don't talk to one another. They don't link up. And so once you're in one organization, you may not it may not be very easy to jump to another organization. They don't talk to one another. They're all privatized in some sense of the word. And so how do we connect them so that the flow of transition up, down, out can be managed a little bit more efficiently? And then um, just to reiterate, the whole development process hinges upon transitions and changes and adaptation to those changes. That's what our individual uh, human development literature talks about, also talks about kind of from a community development standpoint in, in such a way. So development, um, what underpins de the developmental process is change. And if you can't resolve the change, if you can't adapt from the change, then you can't positively develop. Or you might develop negatively. You might actually go down. So um, that's, if we really want to use sport for a developmental purpose, or if we're looking at a developmental system for the sport itself or the athletes within it, then we need to make sure we can manage the transition and changes that people are going to experience appropriately. So resources are needed. I'm talking about social support, so micro or at the interpersonal level, um, as well as kind of the you know uh, bigger level institutional support, macro or organizational level. So just think about if you don't have a facility to offer basketball, then there's not going to be many basketball players, okay? Um, so think about the facilities. Um, the school systems have a major stake into this and provide resources for our uh, participation and participants. Individual factors and characteristics and traits. So we talked about age, gender, social economic class. Just your psychological state, self-esteem, motiv your motivation, and what you kind of value all might be different. And those are factors that we need to consider if we're going to provide resources needed uh, for, for people to overcome transitions and changes. And then the nature of the pr transition itself. How do people perceive the transition? If someone blows out their knee walking to work, you know, that might be, so, and they have health care, they have, you know, a wife to take care of them or a best friend or a family, and they have all these resources around them. Well, that knee injury then becomes, or an understanding boss, those resources really become helpful to overcoming, you know, maybe something that's pretty traumatic for somebody. But take away all those away. The same injury, a knee injury, and nobody helps them financially or just say, hey, you'll get back, or a coach or a athletic trainer or a physical therapist to help them overcome the physiological limitations of the injury. Um, so all of these things might affect someone's perception of a change in their life. Okay, Death of a loved one. If you have a lot of people around you that can help you through it, you're more likely to adapt quicker. But if you don't, if you're all alone and, you, and someone um, maybe leaves your life, then it might take a while for, for you to overcome that. So anyway, think about that um, in our sports system. So g kind of circling back around. Um, so hopefully you understand a little bit more about the sport paradigm through recruitment, through retention of athletes, the transition of athletes, and then also the support system athletes um, are around them. These are what we're talking about in sport development. And so this is, I, I was very uh, much focused today on the athlete, but you can also look at the sport in and of itself. So take skateboarding or any sport for that matter and kind of run it through the, this. You know, how do you, um, you know, retain or recruit participants into that sport might, you know, affect the sport uh, I guess, livelihood or, or likely to succeed, if that makes sense. And how do you transition the sport from a maybe leisure activity all the way up to a competitive level at the, um, at the Olympic, maybe at the Olympic level or pro level, okay? So the sport um, aspect could also um, be affected by some of these um, things that we talked about today. So hopefully that was some good insight on module two um, about sport development or development of sport.
remember that the pyramid model, again, you can't really see that behind me, but is just an analogy. It doesn't have to be that way. Sport Canada is, doesn't look that way. I mean, it's similar, but it has some differences. So start thinking about what does a sport system look like when you start to combine or to um, really unpack all the components and elements needed um, for successful recruitment, retention, and transition of our athletes. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please email me, call me, and I'll be glad to um, go a little bit further. Thank you.